Um, so yes, as um, Anna Maria said, I'm um, currently the TV editor at The Guardian, but um, I um, have moved over just temporarily from being opinion editor. Um, that's the opinion site at The Guardian. Um, opinion's a really good place to pitch, generally speaking, and it's where a lot of freelancers pitch to because they commission so much on such a wide variety of stories. Um, but there's lots of different places you can choose to pitch. Um, the Guardian has features of all types of varieties and various different um, places you can pitch features to, like The Guide, Life and Arts, Weekend Magazine. Um, uh, this is just a quote that I appreciated from Kath Weiner, who's our editor, um, who, just making the point that um, we are all, as readers of publications, now much more um, involved in the journalism. We are um, wanting to hear from our readers and we're wanting to hear from people like you who have experiences that we don't as journalists. I know there's people from all over the world um, on this chat now and you know, you're bound to have expertise in a way that our journalists can't, even if we've got people embedded in the country that you live in. The chances are that if you're from there and you've lived there all your life, you'll know stuff and understand things about your um, location that we don't. So your perspective is valuable. Um, so I think it's always good to think about what it is that you know about what your passion is, because I think when people write about what their passion is and pitch on what their passion is, it's more likely to be accepted. It's more likely to offer something interesting that we um, that we want to hear. So that can range across a whole the whole gamut of life, really, whether it's childcare, uh, climate change, sex, literature, the place that you're from all of these things are interesting and all of these things are subjects that somebody will be commissioning on. Um, and think about finding your voice. The best writers sound like themselves, I always think. Um, and so I think oftentimes people try and write in, an, uh, in a way that sounds like a journalist, that sounds like a professional. It's far more important, I think, to sound authentically like yourself. Um, that way people will enjoy reading you the most. From the wide variety of writers that we have at The Guardian, you can see the best ones, the ones that you're probably fans of, really sound like themselves. Because ultimately, editors need freelancers. We need people to be pitching. We need your ideas. Editors come up with ideas, of course, but ultimately it makes our life so much easier if we have good ideas coming to us from freelancers pitching. So one of the first things I always think to think about when you're pitching is a news peg. Just before I start all of this, all of these rules, of course, get broken. Um, whatever I say during this presentation, you'll be able to come up with examples where you might have been commissioned or somebody else has been commissioned, which breaks all of these rules. But these are just general tips to help with your pitching that give you the best chance of being commissioned. So when I talk about a news peg, what I mean is something that's in that day, that week's news, that you can pitch around. We on uh, The Guardian tend to stick very closely to whatever's in that day's news, um, if not that week's news. That means you need to be really on it with keeping track of what's happening in the world and getting your pitches in very quickly after the thing that's happened that relates to your idea has happened. Um, if it doesn't have a news peg, it's much harder to place. There are, of course, sections such as long reads, um, even some of the features that take a longer term view. But even then, there's likely to be some form of news peg, even if it's slightly older. Some reason why we're running this piece now. It's very rare that a piece just comes out of nowhere and has nothing to do with what's going on in the world, even if it's just a general trend piece. So I always think it's worth pitching on the same day um, that something hits the news. And if you have advanced knowledge of something that's going to hit the news the next day, even better, because then you can pitch to your editor before they even know that something's coming. Um, having said that, have fun. When you're pitching, when you're writing, it comes across. If you can have fun while you're writing, we'll know. So be opinionated, be entertaining, write in your own voice going to be far more convincing as a pitch that you're the right person to write it if it's clear that you're actively excited by what it is that you're suggesting writing about. Um, as part of this, I think as writers these days, we all know the dangers of social media. And I think what it's led to is a lot of writers, professional, like the big name writers that you can think of, they second guess their critics in their writing. 
and it's really damaging to their writing. I think if you're trying to caveat everything by worrying about what someone might say, um, then it's going to impinge your pitch and it's going to ultimately impinge your piece as well. Um, so you can't expect to cover off every possible criticism. You're going to be writing in a limited um, limited word space. So just accept the fact that, that there's going to be people out there who aren't going to like what you say. Um, in the same way, we get a lot of pitches from people who are very expert in what they're saying, which means they know a lot more about their subject than I do as an editor. That's excellent. That's the best. That's the most exciting thing is when I can read something that I don't know about, but it can often mean that their knowledge gets in the way of the writing and that can be even more damaging in a pitch because you try and cram in everything you know about a subject to prove that you're the expert on it, to prove that you know a lot about it, that you're the right person to write about it. But that just obscures the great idea that's lying at the centre of your pitch. That's why I would say don't let that knowledge, don't let your expertise get in the way of what you're trying to say. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not coronavirus, I promise. Um, be snappy, um, especially with your pitch email, but that's in all your writing, I would say. Um, brevity is a skill and it's the hardest thing to do. Editors get hundreds of pitches every day. The number of pitches I get to my personal email address and to the general culture email address is staggering. Get to the point quickly, which means use the subject line wisely. I often say to people that the subject line is the most important part of your pitch. You need to make sure that subject line is covering off as much as possible in as short a space as possible. The main things that you want to consider is why you why now and what's your argument what is it that you're trying to say um why you is obvious why why are you the right person to write on something why is why now why is why is now the right time to run something on this subject and what is it that you want to say that seems like a lot but if you think about the headline of a piece oftentimes we'll be trying to encapsulate all three of those things in our headlines as a way to sell your piece if we commission it to our audience so if you can think about that with your subject line, your subject line is your sell for your pitch. The fact is that most editors aren't able to read every pitch that comes through to them. So they're scanning through their inbox, scanning through the hundreds of pictures they've got to look for interesting subject lines that might work as a, as a piece. So if you can really sell yourself in that subject line, you've got more chance of the editor reading your pitch and therefore much more chance to it being commissioned ultimately. Be an expert. What do you know that others don't? We get so many pictures every day. The thing that is going to make you stand out the most is to um, is the fact that you know more about it than other people. Um, I I think that 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 with uh, TV is a great example of this. We get lots of pictures which feel very generic. Feel like it's someone who just happens to watch some TV and had this thought come to their head. Why is it that you're the right person to write on this as opposed to the 10 other people that have pitched on a similar thing? This expertise is often thought of in terms of academia, in terms of the education you have or the professional experience that you have, but that's not necessarily the case. I think lived experience is just as important, especially in features and opinion writing. Your lived experience, what you, what you know from your life that other people don't can be just as... Um, much a part of your expertise as anything else and can be far more interesting to read oftentimes than an academic who studied it for 20 years. Having said that, of course, education is impossible. I know that opinion at the moment is running lots of fascinating pieces about coronavirus from proper experts on epidemiology, on immunology, on vaccinations. So think about what your education has taught you, which means that you're the right person to write on something. Be quirky. Like I just said, we get hundreds of pitches. We get tens, 20, 30, all on the same subject. When a TV program hits, the number of pitches I get that are broadly the same is, is a, it's, it's a lot. It's hard to get through. So your pit, though they then all blend into one. It's very hard to engage with something when you're having kind of multiple pitches on almost exactly the same subject. So be quirky. That can be in the 
the actual subject you're thinking about, the news topic, that might be something that's not on the main Guardian front page of news, for example. It might be a news story that you feel slipped under the, um, under the radar of most mainstream news organisations. That's quirky, that's different, that's going to stand out. But it might also be that you've just got a different angle on something that everybody's talking about. You might think about something coronavirus is the obvious example because it dominates the news so much we have so many pictures on that and opinions you know loads of them most of them saying the same stuff maybe you have something which is a slightly different angle on that which will make it stand out and so I think if you can think about how not to be predictable with your pitch don't think of the obvious angle on something think of something a little bit different it will really help I think don'ts inevitably take up a lot of what I think about when I'm talking to people about pitches because there are so many things that um, a lot of people get wrong in the same way. <clears throat> I think um, this is just a list of some of the most common things that I think people get wrong. <clears throat> Sorry. Don't pre-write. Um, I get lots of pieces where pitches where people have attached the piece that they've done at kind of 1,500 words, 2,000 words on a subject. Um, editors the thing that i enjoy most um is talking to someone about the idea helping to build it out if you pre-written it's um it means that i feel like i can't engage with you on the idea in quite the same way and it also means you might have wasted your time so pitch before you write generally speaking or if you have pre-written because you just had to get it off your chest don't send it to the editor you don't need to let them know that you've pre-written um don't send over more than one idea at a time. It makes it look like you're not passionate about any one of them and that you don't really want to write anyone in particular. You just want a commission. Might be the case. You know, we all need to eat. We all need to, as freelance journalists, you, you need to get paid. So, of course, you've got more than one idea percolating at the same time. But perhaps think about sending those to different publications. If you send the same editor three, four, five ideas, I don't know which one you're most interested in. It makes me makes me think that you're not that interested in any of them or that engaged in any of them. Um, this is a difficult one, but I think it's and it's not a hard and fast rule, but don't pitch on race and gender issues if you don't have first hand experience. I think generally speaking, don't pitch on something to do with Black Lives Matter if um, you're not a person of colour. Um, it's unlikely that you've got the perspective that's valuable at this particular point. Um, don't pitch on issues of feminism if you're not a woman. Um, it, 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 the fact is that publications now want to hear from people who have first-hand experience of um, those, those types of topics. Um, and so it's something you have to really think about when you're pitching. Um, there are obviously exceptions to this. Um, you might have a particular expertise. You might have been um, researching um, the history of um, empire, for example, and they want to pit, therefore want to pitch a piece around Black History Month, even though you're a white academic, and that's fine. And that's obviously you've got expertise. But I think, as a general rule, think really carefully if you're a man and you're pitching on women's issues. Um, don't pitch on something we've already covered. Um, it, it makes us, makes it look like you're not really paying attention to what we're doing and you don't really know, um, you're not really following our publication and that's not great. It gives us a bad impression of you. Um, and what that means is that you need, as freelancers, um, part of what your job is, is really following very carefully the publications that you want to pitch and you need to be reading, reading, reading. And the more you've read, the better idea you'll get of the kind of pieces we're looking for but also you'll find out what we've done and therefore you won't be wasting your time pitching something we've already covered. Um, as a general rule, again, this is not hard and fast, but don't pitch on things that are the biggest story of the day. We've got coronavirus covered, we've got Brexit covered, we've got the US election covered, we've got in-house journalists, we've got hundreds of pitches coming in from everyone. If you pitch on those massive stories, much, much harder to get commissioned. Um, don't pitch a 3,000 word piece to opinion or to TV. Um, we don't run pieces of that length on those sections. Again, that's part of knowing where you're pitching. If you know where you're pitching to, you'll know the kind of pieces we take, the kind of length of piece that we take. And therefore, you'll know that we don't run those length of pieces. You should know that on opinion, they commission things between about 600 and 1,200 words. And so that's the kind of piece you want to be pitching to them. 
if you follow the TV desk closely, you'll know we pitch, uh, we run things between about 600 and 2000 words max. Therefore, you don't want to be pitching something longer than that. Another don't I think is cool. Um, don't use the phone. Uh, I don't know many editors that like being bothered on the phone, to be honest. We all have email now, and I think that's even more true since we're all working at home. Um, use email. Um, I know, I've noticed, I've, I can see here that Alexandra's just asked in the chat um, it, that we, uh, you don't want to repeatedly hassle people. I think you need, you might need to follow up and that's absolutely fine, but don't repeatedly hassle an editor. It's uh, not going to be appreciated. If you haven't heard back, it's probably a no. Um, so I think it's, fair, it's fine as a freelance journalist to put in your pitch email I need to hear back from by 3 p.m. this afternoon, otherwise I'm going to pitch to other publications. That's absolutely fine. And then perhaps an hour before your deadline, you could send a follow-up just to let you know, if I don't hear back from you in an hour, I'm going to be pitching somewhere else. Um, we appreciate that you need to pitch to other places. Um, we don't want you pitching to multiple places at the same time because it can get confusing. Therefore, I think it's absolutely fine to set a deadline. If you don't set a deadline like that, um, say you, you, you're you not that bothered, I would say you can follow up the next day if you want. And then if you've sent if you've sent the original pitch and the follow up and you still haven't heard back, I would leave it at that point. That means they're probably not interested. And this sounds like an obvious one, but you'd be astonished by how many people do it. Don't use unsubstantiated stats or facts. In a pitch email, even a really short one, it's so easy to hyperlink now to your sources. So do that. You don't need to write it all out, but if you're saying something, make sure it's substantiated by research. We get a lot of stuff which is based on hunches, especially in TV, like, oh, I want to write about why men don't like X TV programme. Make sure it's backed up by something and not just your feeling or a couple of chats you've had with friends. <clears throat> Those are the general don'ts. Um, there are lots of other don'ts um, and equally, that I will almost certainly have commissioned numerous people who broke those rules and did things that I'm saying to you not to do because the idea was so good. And if you have a great idea, it can sail above all of those things. But generally those things are not great to do. So when we're talking about pitching, what are the first steps you need to do? Before you pitch, research the publication. There are so many different publications and we all have different styles and different types of things we're looking for. So before you hit send on that pitch email, make sure you've read it. Make sure you um, know the place that you're pitching to back to front. So you know what type of piece we run, what we've already run, and then you'll have a best idea of how to tailor your pitch to that publication. We'll work out when is the best time to pitch. Don't rush it unless you have to. So the timing can be about um, when the news story is hitting, um, when you, if you can find out when editors have their meetings, when they're discussing ideas, that can be really helpful. I know when I was on Opinion, we used to have a meeting at about quarter past nine in the morning um, and we were expected to come to that meeting with two or three ideas. And perhaps I'd had a busy morning and I hadn't had the time to scour the newspapers for my own ideas. And so I could go into my inbox, find a few good pictures from freelancers, and then I can turn up at the meeting with an idea ready to go that I haven't had to think about and with someone attached to it who's going to write it. And that makes my job as an editor so much easier. So if you can find out when those type of meetings are happening, all the better. Send one idea at a time to one outlet at a time. As I said, if you send more than one idea at a time, it makes it look like you don't really feel very passionately about the ideas that you're sending. And if you're pitching multiple outlets at the same time, it can be really frustrating for an editor if I get to a pitch that you've sent um, an hour, you've sent the idea and it's already been commissioned by one of our rivals. I know you may think that it gives you the best chance of being commissioned to hit send on the pitch email to 10 places at the same time. But the chances are if you're sending the pitch to 10 places, you've not tailored your pitch properly to any of those publications, which reduces your chance of getting commissioned. And it also increases your chances of alienating the editors that you are pitching to. So really think about where it is that you want to pitch to and pitch to that, pitch to your preferred outlet first. As I say, set deadlines, 
absolutely fine to do that but do do it once at one at a time use the subject field wisely it's your headline it's your cell it's how you get me to read your email so really think about those 10 15 words that you're putting in that subject line because that's what is gonna sell your piece to me and then make sure you read it through before you hit send um i don't care about spelling mistakes i don't expect writers to have perfect spelling or grammar certainly not if they're they're writing to me in their second language third language fourth language it's impressive enough to me that you that anyone speaks more than one language as someone who only speaks basic french and spanish and struggles with english sometimes um but um i do expect the pitch that you've sent to make sense um, I expect you to have spelt my name right. That's just a real, I think that's a bugbear that all editors have. Um, my email address has my name in it, so you should be able to spell it right. Um, so um, make sure you've read it through and you're happy with what you're sending. A pitch needs to answer three questions. What is the story that you're pitching or the argument you're pitching if it's for opinion? Um, why is now the right time to run it or why should we care about the um, argument that you're making and why are you the right person to write it? Think about those three things when you're writing your pitch um, and try and get as many of them into your subject line as possible. Um, then if you can answer those questions in a paragraph, in a pitch and in a line in your subject line then it's going to make it so much easier for me as an editor to commission you <clears throat> the first question what is the story or argument you should be able to express that in a sentence or two preferably one sentence a broad subject or a theme isn't a story idea so i've noticed that uh, a lot of women are writing very successful tv programs this year that's not an idea. That's something that you've noticed that's happening in the world. An idea is the subject plus your angle on it, plus the audience that you think there is for your idea, plus the news, the thing that's happening. So the fact that a lot of women are writing successful TV programs could be the hook for a piece that you want to write about why it is that you think female writers have suddenly been empowered to write TV programs this year. That's, a, that's an idea. Um, that's you taking the thing that you've noticed and spinning it out in something that could make a piece. Um, avoid the obvious. Avoid writing things that everybody already knows. Um, I think certainly around the time of Brexit, we were getting a lot of kind of Brexit is bad pieces. And, you know, I think you can assume that we will have... I think you can assume that the Guardian audience, for example, shares that opinion, broadly speaking. It's obvious, um, so don't pitch on it. <clears throat> I just want to answer Laura's question quickly from the chat because I noticed that. Um, I, think, as I, I think as an editor, part of my job is to, if you're, a, if you're coming to me and you're writing from, say, Japan and you want to write about that and you obviously have an expertise on a subject that I don't and your English grammar or your English spelling isn't perfect, then I don't think most editors will have a problem with that. Part of my job as an editor is to polish your writing. That's what I do. It's what I enjoy doing as an editor. And so I don't think it should it should be an impediment to you that your, your English or your... Um, whether it's grammar or spelling isn't perfect because I should be able to help you with that. I know lots of people that write in English as their first language for a living um, at the Guardian even, whose spelling and grammar is far from perfect. We have editors like me and then we have sub editors whose job it is to fix that stuff. So don't worry about it. If your idea is good enough, it's not gonna hold you back. So back to what I was saying. So the second question of the questions that um, a pitch must answer, what is the hook? Could it be a news event that's happening right now? That's the most common form of hook. Um, what is it that's happening in the world that means that your piece is the right one to run right now? What is the news story that has sparked the idea that you have? If it isn't news, then you need to think a bit harder about where the urgency is. Why does it need to be commissioned now? Why does it need to be out there now? Why do people want to read it at this moment? Why should I commission it? 
if that urgency doesn't exist, you need to think about why should people care? Often time, if that urgency isn't there, maybe they don't, but maybe you've got an idea which is about a broader theme or an interesting thing that people will care about. It's just not particularly of the moment. Um, I think of a, a long read that was hugely successful, which was about um, the plans for if the Queen dies. This wasn't particularly news peg. There wasn't any prospect of the Queen dying immediately, but it was such an interesting subject. It, it told people things that they didn't know about a subject that they're generally curious about, that it obviously encouraged people to read it. So really think about that's a much harder thing to do. Why should people care if there's no urgency, if there's no news, if there's no now to your idea, but it is possible. <clears throat> the third question, why me? Why are you the right person to write this piece? Uh, maybe you just have an original, brilliant idea. That's the best kind of idea. That's what I'm looking for in a pitch. It's what I'm looking for from freelance writers is great ideas. Part of my job as an editor is coming with up with ideas and going to writers to write them, but it makes my job so much easier. It makes all our jobs as editors easier. If freelance um, journalists are coming to us with great ideas. It might be that you're a brilliant writer. Um, Again, I want brilliant writers. So if you are a great writer, show me in your pitch. Your pitch should be fantastically well written. It should be a paragraph of beautifully written idea if you are a great writer. Don't tell me, don't write in your piece, I've got an original brilliant idea and I'm a great writer, therefore you should commission me. You should be able to show me that in, in your pitch. Or perhaps it's that you have access to a person, a place, other material that others don't have. Maybe you've got holders and documents that reveal something that means that you can write a piece that nobody else could. Perhaps you've got an interview lined up with someone that nobody else has. Perhaps you are living in Japan and sorry, I'm going back to Japan again, just because I'd quite like to visit Japan, but perhaps you live in Japan and therefore you have access to a place that most of the Guardian journalists don't. And therefore you can write something about that place that other people can't. Or perhaps you have relevant expertise or personal experience that means that you're the right person to write something. There's a piece on the Guardian website today by the broadcaster Emma Barnett, who's writing about endometriosis. And obviously her personal experience is key to why she's writing that piece because she's suffered from that so those personal experience pieces are very common in terms of what lots of different places are publishing these days so you can think about that as well in terms in terms of what it is that makes you the right person to write something and whatever you do i'll say this again use the subject field wisely it is the most important part of your pitch it's where you can get everything you want to say into 10 words or less. And it is likely to be the only part of your pitch that is seen if it's bad. If it's a bad subject line, it probably isn't going to be, your email won't be opened, your pitch will never be seen. You'll never get a reply. So make sure you really think about that. That's almost the most important thing. If you can tell me in 10 words why you're the right person to write it, why now is the right person to run it, um, what your idea is, that's fantastic. That's what I want. Within your email address, include contact details. It's really useful. I know I said don't call me, but sometimes if you've got an immediate idea, a really urgent thing that you want to be um, to run, then it really helps if I can pick up the phone and call you and get hold of you immediately to talk about this piece that you're going to file to me in the next few hours so I can have on the website that same day. And um, if, if photos are going to be part of what you're doing, then let me know what you have access to, if that's going to be relevant. So after you've pitched, um, what's next? Um, if you get a no, keep on going. Learn from your no and try to place the piece elsewhere. Um, I always think so many people don't get a reply to their pictures. So if you've had a no, it's an in in some ways. You can you can feel free to follow up and say um, if uh, if they've not given you a good reason of why they've not pitched, then perhaps it, I think it's fine to get back to them and say, "Oh, could you give me? Could you let me know why it didn't work for you and what kind of pieces you're looking for?" Um, you if someone's personally replied to you, then you've got a little in with that editor to have a conversation. They might not have time for it. They might not reply to you again, but use that chance if you get. Try and learn from your no. One of the best things 
in life is to learn from your mistakes and it's not necessarily a mistake but to learn from your failures i suppose um and that can help you be successful in the future but if you get commissioned which is what you're all aiming for things can go wrong from there too so if you do get a yes make sure you deliver what you promised make sure the piece is everything you said it would be um get your facts right credit your sources use hyperlinks use links to all your evidence um and write it as well as time will allow, which means going through it and editing it, making sure it's the best piece you can possibly deliver. Sometimes on opinion, I was asking people to write pieces in two hours. Um, so I know that time's limited then, and maybe the people's prose and their writing wouldn't be as good as it could be. And as an editor, I'm fully understanding of that. And I don't expect it necessarily to be the most sparkling, brilliantly written piece where I'm only giving you two hours to do it. But if I'm giving you two weeks to do it, then I expect it to be well polished well edited by you to be the best piece you can possibly deliver so think about that if you do get published then i think it's really important to engage with your readers um so much of what we do now is is about that whether that's engaging with your readers in the comment thread below a piece if it's open whether it's engaging on social media i know it's really hard and um people do get um problems online especially on social media but the guardian comments these days i know they had a bit of a bad reputation at one point perhaps but they're such a lovely lovely community now our moderators manage all the conversations really beautifully there's these great conversations that happen below the line on guardian pieces and if writers get involved in it the conversations become so much more interesting and they might even spark your next idea something someone says in a in a comment thread might lead you towards your next story and it will certainly impress your editor if you're there engaging with the readers of their publication. And then thank your editor. Um, we all like praise. We all like to be thanked. We all like being appreciated. So say thank you to your editor for commissioning you. Say thank you for the wonderful they've jo job they've done editing you. Um, try and build that relationship. If you've been commissioned by someone, it's a real chance to start building the relationship with that editor. And maybe they'll be able to commission you again in the future. And then start working on your next idea. Um, you just because you've had one piece commissioned it's very unlikely that piece is going to sustain you for very long um certainly the pay isn't great for freelance journalists often these days so you need to start working on your next idea quickly so get on it um here's just a a few examples of uh, good pictures um uh, people have been asking about what makes a good subject line. This is one that um, we commissioned actually because it was, but the subject line is just, it was a general one that was just sent to the opinion inbox. Um, betting shop closures, an ex employee's opinion on FOBTs and social responsibility. So it didn't give me the exact angle that they wanted to write on, but it gave me the subject very clearly what they want to write about the closure of betting shops. And then it gave me who they were, why it is that they have the expertise. They're an ex-employee of a betting shop. Therefore, they know something that our journalists aren't going to know. They have a perspective on it that other people don't. And then the social responsibility, that gives me a clue as to what it is, the angle that they're going to write on. So a good pitch has a clear description in the subject line, explains why and explains why you should write it. And it's no more than a few lines. This one's actually a bit long, I would say. You actually... You should be able to get your pitch in a, over a, um, in about four or five sentences. The shorter you have it um, with as much information as possible, the more chances there are that I will be able to read the whole thing. And then just pitch, pitch lots, pitch often, pitch to lots of different places, not at the same time. Um, pitch to the places that fit the piece that you're going to write. Don't be put off by your rejections. Um, you're going to get lots of them. You're going to get lots of not replies to good pictures as well. You might think you had the best idea in the world and an editor's not going to have replied. And it's not necessarily a reflection of the pitch that you sent. It's just a reflection of the fact that we have hundreds of pictures every day and we can't possibly reply to all of them. I personally, everything that comes to my personal inbox, I try really hard to reply to all of the emails that come addressed to me. Um, I make a real effort to do that. Um, but um not everyone does that not everyone can do that not everyone's on top of their inbox as i am so you might not get a reply certainly if you're sending it to the general inboxes like opinion or g2 or features then you're not necessarily going to get a response to that and that's difficult it's really dispiriting but don't be put off because the best thing you can do is keep on trying and so therefore 
this is it's over to you. Look beyond the big stories. Think about your expertise. Think about how your rely your life relates to the news, because that might give you a clue as to what you can write that nobody else can. Think about what makes you angry, what makes you animated, what makes you passionate. Those are the things that you're going to be able to write on with the most feeling. That are going to be the most engaging. And think about what you could say that nobody else could. And think about whether you you can say it in a way that nobody else could because those are the things that are going to be the best pictures. Those are the things that are really going to engage me as a reader and me as an editor. Um, so many people pitch on things and it's so evident they don't feel very strongly about what they're pitching about. They're not that interested in it. So please pitch to me about stuff that you care about because it really does come across, even in a few lines, that you're the person that really cares about this issue. Um, and that's going to mean that you've got the best chance of being commissioned in the future. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now so you can see my beardy face. Um, that worked. Um, but yeah, um, the, I think if you can think about what it is that you care about, what it is that you're the best person to write about, then that's going to give you the best chance of getting commissioned. Um, I think we're going to do some questions now. I see there's been lots of them in the chat. Um, I think Anna Maria is going to field them to me. Is that correct? Yeah, Toby, thank you very much for these uh, great tips and suggestions. We got a lot of questions and uh, Linda and Estela tried to organize them uh, by blogs. So Linda, you can start uh, with the doubts of our community. Thank you everyone for the great questions. And if you have more of them, Please put them in the chat and we will try to manage uh, to answer and get answers to all of them. Um, so firstly, Toby, thank you for the useful and insightful presentation. I think it was already covering a lot of great tips. And uh, so we have some additional questions. Uh, firstly, some people like Alice and you did are interested if you actually have an example of a great subject line. So that I gave you that one uh, just there about the fob tees, um, which I think was a really good one, um, where it was someone who was able to get, let me see if I can, shall I open that one up again for you? Oh, it's not letting me do it now, sorry. My, um, but yeah, that was, that was a, that's a good one, I think, um, because it had who they were, um, betting shop closures right at the start. So it had the subject, um, an ex-employee's opinion telling me who they are, and then on fob tees, and social responsibility. So it gave me an idea of what it was they wanted to write about that subject. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that they managed to do in 10, 11 words. They managed to tell me what the story is, who they are and, the, and what they are wanting to write about. And that's what you need to be aiming to do in a pitch. I, I often tell people that a good way to think about a subject line is like a headline. So look at the headlines that the publication that you're pitching to uses and then maybe think about writing your subject line in the same way that they would write a headline because that shows me immediately that you have a familiarity with my publication and it's also how we sell our own pieces so that's the best sell that's the way we sell it's the way we think is the best way to sell a piece so it's how you should sell your piece to me as well in a pitch okay it's a good advice um there's an interesting question from Daniela who asked if there is a better day in which to pitch. So this is going to change. This is going to vary lots between publications and it's a really hard thing for me to answer for anything beyond um, my experience at the Guardian. I would generally say Monday is a bad day to pitch most people because they're getting, they're coming back to work after the weekend and Oh, I've disappeared. Um, they're coming back to work after the weekend and they've got a million pictures that have landed in their inbox and they're trying to clear through all of that um, and your one could well just get lost in the wash. So don't pitch on a Monday, ideally pitch on a Tuesday because they probably cleared their inbox by then. Um, don't pitch over the weekend. Again, that follows the same kind of rules because most editors don't work over the weekend and so probably aren't checking their inboxes. So unless it's a really urgent story related to something that's happening on the Saturday or Sunday, don't do it. Um, just wait, wait a little bit. Um, and then you can also, if you want to get really granular on it, you can think, like I said, think about meeting times. Um, ask editors this. If you get a rejection from someone or it's someone you've worked with before and they've accepted a pitch of you, feel free to ask them, when do you like to be pitched? When's a good time for you? Do you have a meeting where you talk about ideas with other editors? And would you like to have pitches before that? 
um i think that kind of thing shows that you're you've got a greater understanding of what um our life is like and how it all works and it shows that you're engaged in that process um and i don't think anyone's going to object to being asked those kind of questions thank you so you mentioned uh, uh, pitching meetings so ron has asked like how do you find out uh, information about pitch meetings when you're not part of the publications private group and if you don't have a network so should you email an editor and ask them directly when are your pitch meetings or do you have other tips yeah ask them find out who the editors are of sections and ask them that might be through emailing them it might be through getting in touch with them on social media um i'm not going to say that everyone's going to give you a response to that question but ask them that's the only way to do it um and i think it's the kind of thing that most editors will be happy to answer Thank you. And uh, Alexandra is asking, do you know at all how similar the pitching process is for the Guardian's audio and video sections? And do they accept pitches from freelancers? They do accept pitches from freelancers. I think every section of the Guardian accepts pitches from freelancers, which isn't to say that their budgets are necessarily able to take many of them, but they do accept the pitches. Um, I don't know exactly how it works in audio and video, so I can't help you there, but I would say try and find out who the editor is for the um, the I, the section that you want to write through and try and get in touch with them that way. Um, I think a good way to work this out, use Twitter, see what kind of things they're tweeting out. So you can get an idea of the kind of pieces that editors like by the pieces that they're publicising. It's the kind of, it's either going to be pieces they like or pieces they've commissioned and that can give you an idea of who the right person to pitch to is. Okay, and um, we had a lot of questions about language. But uh, Lucy also asked, like, if you're pitching from abroad, does the subject always has to be UK related? No, not at all. The Guardian, um, I'm going to talk about The Guardian here because I assume that's what she's asking about. But The Guardian um, takes pieces about um, all over the world. Um, I would say one thing to consider is that we have a separate Australian desk and a separate, sorry, Australian office and a separate US office. So if it's Australia or US related, I would pitch to those two offices rather than to the UK office, but everywhere else in the world, absolutely fine to pitch on that. Um, Mihika, who's been in the chat, is someone I've commissioned, and that was not a UK angled piece um, on opinion. They take commissions on subjects for to do with all over the world. Um, so don't be, no, absolutely not. Um, we're interested in covering a broad scope of um, ideas from around the world. Thank you. And uh, some questions about uh, yeah, your sources and uh, the information about the piece. So is it okay to pitch before uh, you're sure that you have all the sources ready? Yes, if you're confident on what you're saying then I would say it's absolutely fine to pitch before you've got it all lined up. I don't expect you have done all your homework necessarily before your pitch, but it would be very frustrating if you pitch something and then I accepted it. And then a couple of hours later, you were like, oh, I've done my research now and it doesn't stack up. So make sure what you're saying stacks up, but you don't need to have all your sources to hand when you pitch. And additionally, Anna Maria is asking uh, when you mention people that you would like to interview for your piece, do you have to like really mention that you have secured these interviews or is it uh, implied uh, and you don't need to spell it out? I would spell it out. It's only going to help because we do get people who say, I'm, 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 I want to talk to X and Y and then it turns out they haven't got those interviews secured and it was just pie in the sky. So if you have got them secured in advance, then say I've got interviews with X and Y lined up already to speak about this. Okay, and uh, Helen asks uh, that uh, she's always concerned that the pitches will be swiped by an in-house writer. How do you safeguard your idea? Do you have any comments on that? You can't protect an idea, but it would be very bad practice for an editor to get an idea from a freelancer and give it to an in-house person. Um, so certainly at The Guardian, you should be confident that that's not going to happen. Um, I can't speak to other publications in terms of that sort of thing, but it's very, very bad practice and very frowned upon. So um, I would just assume that people aren't going to do that. Don't protect your idea too jealously. Um, the chances are people aren't going to steal your idea. If it's a really great idea, they're probably just going to commission you. Having said that, one thing that I have experienced is freelancers thinking they've got this most original idea in the world and us not commissioning it and then them saying oh but so and one of your in-house people has done this you've stolen our idea when i know for a fact that wasn't the case 
um, because say we commissioned it before your pitch came in. So just because you've had what you think is a great idea and we've done it with an in-house person, it doesn't mean we've stolen your idea. It just means that you did have a great idea, but we also had it. The fact is that good ideas are usually had by more than one person at the same time. Um, so don't assume the worst if the, the same idea your idea gets written up by somebody else perhaps take heart from it because it shows that you're on the right track with the kind of ideas you've had but maybe you just didn't get in there quick enough thank you yeah that's a good point <laughs> um later we had some questions also about this why you question that you should address in your pitch uh, laura oliver shared her story and she said um, she tries to cover the why you part of the pitch by offering access to great sources of, or data, or if she has reported on it before or has an additional knowledge. But uh, she often worries about whether this is a, enough uh, when you compare yourself to others who have lived experience of a subject or a specialist in one area. So what do you think about that? I um, don't doubt yourself is all I can say. Um, there's different types of pieces sometimes we're looking for a piece from an expert in terms of the things they know the sources they have the number of times they've written about something and sometimes we're looking for a piece with someone with lived experience they tend to be very different types of pieces and we look for a, a balance of that we're not just commissioning lived experience pieces and we're not just commissioning pieces by experts anymore um so um just be confident that we are looking for both those things and if you do have expertise on a subject that isn't lived experience then that's still valuable and still valued yeah and we had also more uh, questions about yeah, this previous experience and how important uh, it is to send previous work examples ricardo is asking and uh, does it uh, matter if you're not that experienced uh, uh, of the topic uh, yeah it, um Sending examples is fine. Like you can put it, I would put it at the bottom of your pitch, like right at the end, because the chances are that I won't have chance to go through your um, your examples. But it's absolutely if you've got a long, you know, cut, lots of cuttings and things you can link to by all means, it link to it and it can show me that you're an experienced journalist if I haven't worked with you before. But generally, don't lean on it too much. It's usually not something that I rely on and the editors rely on when commissioning, um, and on the same note if you're inexperienced whether it be as a writer or on a particular subject if your idea is great if you're showing me that you know about it that's not a problem um i've commissioned lots of first-time writers and i love working with first-time writers actually i love working with baby writers and helping them develop it's one of the most um exciting parts of my jobs and one of the most rewarding parts of my job so absolutely if you're inexperienced if you've not written a lot please don't be put off because the chances are you you've got something about you that is unique that would be valued and that i will enjoy working with you that's a great answer toby and uh, alexeni is asking what about pitching features uh, that are not news are there any other rules or uh, advice that should be followed sorry i missed that question could you repeat that what about pitching features uh, not news so, um, so I know much more about pitching features than news, to be honest. I would say with pitching features, um, make sure you're well, you've read a lot of what that publication is doing, then you get a, you get a, an idea of what it is, the kind of thing they like, and make sure you're not repeating yourself. Um, but with features, just it's the idea. The idea is absolutely key. If you look at something like G2, it's all about having the good idea. It's less connected to what's happening in the news that day, generally speaking, although it does tend to have some kind of peg with something that's going on in the world does tend to have a degree of urgency to it still but it is all about the fantastic ideas so that's the thing you want to think about with features i think thank you um further we have some questions about pitching to multiple outlets um so sana is uh, worried that if you're pitching at one outlet at a time you may end up as a journalist being stuck for days waiting for the newsroom answer and it never happens so what's your advice here yeah it's a it's a real nightmare and that's why I mentioned setting deadlines and I think you can set quite strict deadlines if you need to as well um, but do absolutely feel comfortable setting those deadlines within your pitch say I need to have a response within an hour or I'm going to pitch it elsewhere um, and that's absolutely fine do that because um, that means that it what that does is covers you if they come back to you late so if you pitch me an idea and you said come back to me in an hour 
um, or I'm going to pitch elsewhere and I don't have a chance to read your pitch for another couple of hours, a couple of days, and then I get back to you. If I come back to you saying, yes, I love this idea, I'd like to commission it, and you then tell me, oh, I've pitched elsewhere and it's been accepted somewhere else, I'm so understanding of that and I'm accepting mm -hmm. of that. If you've warned me that you're going to start pitching elsewhere at a certain point, if you've not said that to me, it can be a bit more frustrating. So set those deadlines within your pitches. And uh, Lisa is asking a similar question. Um, she's doing text, video and photos. So can I pitch a photo essay or video to one media outlet and then pitch a text story or on the same idea to another outlet? I would think about whether they are, comp whether they are competitors. Um, if they're direct competitors who are looking for the same audience, then I would say it's not great if I've commissioned your written piece and then find out that you've done a photo essay for The Independent, for example, who is a direct competitor of The Guardian. If it's, if it's a matter of, oh, I've, I've pitched this texting to you, but I pitched this photo essay to a magazine um, which has a very different audience, then I'm probably not going to be that bothered. But then I'd also I'd mention it. If you've been commissioned on something, mention the fact that you've got this coming up somewhere else. Let the editor know. It's just, it's, you know, it's, it's just a courtesy to let them know. But don't pitch the, on the same subject to direct competitors. Thank you. And Aline is uh, asking, uh, she's already registered as a freelance author with a news outlet and wrote for them before, should that be mentioned uh, in the pitch? Yeah, definitely. I think if you've been commissioned by somewhere before them, it, um, it's going to reassure the editor that you're pitching to, that you have a track record of delivering and that you are trusted by some, another editor within the building. And it means they can also go to the editor and ask them about you if they wanted to as well. So I would definitely mention that. Thank you. And uh, Mihik is asking uh, that she feels the print is harder to get accepted to. Uh, are there any special advice how to get accepted uh, for a print media? Um, print is much harder to get accepted to. There's much more limited space in print than there is the internet, generally speaking. Um, at The Guardian, it pays better than the web, generally speaking, as well. So there's that to consider. Um, it's really hard to pitch specifically for print. Um, the, the only advantage of being accepted to print these days is the money um, because the audience is much bigger online. So um, that's something to think about. If you're pitching specifically for print, then read those print publications, see what it is. You can't, um, you can't get an idea of what the Guardian print product is necessarily from looking at our website because we've commissioned so much more and we print so much more on the website than we do in the print product itself. So if you want to get an idea of the kind of piece that they're accepting in print, read the print product. If you're not in Britain, I know that can be much harder to do, but I think there are ways to do it in terms of buying a Kindle version and things like that. But I would say read the print product if you want to be published in it, know what it is they're looking for, because what they publish in print is distinct from what we publish online. There's a certain type of piece, I would say, that goes in print. Thank you. And Venus is asking, uh, what themes are of interest to The Guardian at the moment? That's such a hard question to answer because it's kind of interesting themes are of interest to The Guardian at the moment. I can't give you a definite answer on it. Um, look at the, obviously The Guardian covers lots of, there are certain things which are seen as kind of more Guardian issues, whether it's climate or social justice, um, those kind of things are always of interest to The Guardian. But generally speaking, we're just, we want, we want the, we want to interesting pieces. We want um, themes that are of interest to our readers, um, things that are going to engage people. Um, I think the, there's a general sense of uh, community um, and the sense that we're, I think we're interested in things that engage local communities and the way that localism works at the moment. I think that's of interest, but I would, I mean, I would just generally say um, there is no specific theme that The Guardian will only commission on. It, we just want interesting stuff. And uh, Laura is asking when you're pitching to a certain section like society, should you say that uh, this is for this section or is it for online or if this is something that the editor will decide themselves? Let the editor decide that if you're pitching to a specific editor and you know which section it is that editor works for, then um, it's usually fairly self-explanatory. But um, yeah, don't say um, I'm pitching for this, just pitch to an editor that you think is the right person for the story. Um, I would say at The Guardian, um, 
don't pitch saying I want to get this to go in print because um, it's going to limit your chance of getting commissioned unless you're definite that that is the only thing you will do. Um, but I would, I would, I would warn against doing that. I think it's fine when it gets to a conversation about money to um, to, to have an idea in your head of what do you think your piece is worth in terms of the amount of time it's going to take you to write it. Um, but yeah, don't pitch. We are a web first organization. Um, everything we do goes on the website and that is how people think when they're commissioning things. Yes. And, uh, Laura is asking, um, that often it's, uh, uh, said that you should avoid pitching to a generic email address, uh, but directly to the editor and where can you find their contact details? Uh, often they are not published on the website. So how can you find that out? It's usually, if you can find the email address of one individual at a publisher, a news organisation, then you have the email address for all of them. For example, at The Guardian, it's first name dot last name at theguardian.com. Um, so it's fairly easy to work out. Um, there's, there's tweaks to that at, at all the different news organisations, but usually you can work it out. So if you can find one person's email address, you can find everyone's email address. Yeah, that's a good trick. <laughs> and uh, Daniela is asking, uh, features wise, how much time does it take uh, for the whole process from the pitch to publication? Varies massively. Um, it depends on how urgent we think a piece is. Um, sometimes you might be asked to turn it around in 24 hours or less, but sometimes you might be given weeks. Um, so negotiate that with your editor, depending on how much time you think it needs to be written and how urgent it is. But that, that's something that you'll talk about um, during the process. In, in the kind of quickest we can do things, we can literally, I've, you can commission things at nine in the morning and have it on the website by 3 p.m. like quite comfortably if it's a really urgent story. Thank you. And uh, Rodri is asking, how do you feel if you commission a report and the freelancer comes back and says, okay, here are my terms, here's my contract, even if, if it's for the Guardian, such fee, uh, is that seen as something reasonable? Um, depends. So the Guardian has set terms, which are on the website in terms of uh, what we do in terms of um, whether it's the, the use of your piece afterwards and things like that so you're if you're going to try and set different terms from that you're probably not going to be able to but you can talk about the fee certainly um we have set fees on most sections but there's usually room for negotiation um don't be too rigid um because it's going to make it harder for you to get a commission but by all means come back with your terms you should value your work your writers and your labor is of value and so you should of course um seek to make sure that your rights are protected. Like for example, The Guardian, we pay pieces that get published on The Guardian get syndicated. Um, that's in our general terms of terms of condition when we publish something and you will get a portion of, I think it's 50% of any syndication fee. So if you publish a piece in The Guardian and The New York Times also wants to publish it, they have to pay a fee to that, to The Guardian to do that. And then I think 50% of that goes to the uh, the writer and 50% to the Guardian. I'm not sure exactly on that, but it's something like that. Um, so you'll get extra money for that as well. And uh, Rodi also had another question. So uh, he had had some editors come back and asking for heavy reporting and outline end of the story on the initial pitch. And what's the best way to respond to this when you need to do a lot of potentially costly reporting first and therefore need the commission to do that? I don't think you should expect be expected to do the reporting before you've had a definite commission. Um, so I'd be quite strong on that. If you think it's going to take you hours of work to get the pitch to a level that the editor wants, then I, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say to them, this is going to take me X amount of work and I can't commit to doing it unless you've committed to giving me a commission. Yeah, that makes sense. And, uh... Ruth asks an additional question uh, about this first-hand experience. So being an expert uh, or affected or having this first-hand experience, does it mean that you need to be the part of the story? Um, when you've got first-hand experience, you're probably part of the story in some way, but not, I mean, not, so maybe, sorry, this is perhaps wrong. Maybe if there's a, let me talk about an opinion example. If there's a story going around about, um, prep the drug which um 
helps um, prevent people catching HIV. Um, and there might be a story about uh, that being used. It might not be that you're directly involved in the news story related to that, but you are, for example, a gay man who's already on prep and therefore you have first-hand experience of the issue being discussed, but not the specific news story. Um, so that, so uh, you don't need to have first-hand experience as in be involved in the news story that is being written, but you need, but when you're talking about first-hand experience, it just needs to be of the issue. So maybe you've experienced racism, therefore you feel comfortable writing about the BLM protests in America. That doesn't mean you need to have been at the protests in America necessarily. Okay, and uh, Hannah is asking, is it okay to write something like, as the anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union is approaching, I wanted to propose this and that, or if you would be interested in publishing a story about this and that, or are there yes. ways to phrase it? <laughs> Um, I mean, try and make it as snappy as possible. Like on the 40th anniversary of the Soviet Union, um, I want to write about the what life in Russia is like X years on. But yes, I think that's fine. Anniversaries are quite often used as the peg for a subject. Um, different editors have different opinions on whether they like to run anniversary pieces, but it's certainly something that gets done a lot of the time. And uh, Alin is asking, can it be a good idea to reach out to editors on social media? Yes. Um, I've commissioned numerous people that have got in touch with me on social media. Not all editors like it, not all editors will get back to you. It's going to vary from person to person, but I mean, it's another way to access them. If they're on social media, they're out there to be contacted. Um, so feel free to do it. Just don't hassle them. <laughs> in the same way that you wouldn't send someone a million emails, don't send them a million tweets either. Yeah, that's a good advice. <laughs> and uh, Lisa is asking, can you expect most media outlets to cover expenses incurred while doing your story? Uh, it's going to depend on the kind of expenses you're talking about. If you're like, I want you to pay for my broadband for the day that I'm writing this piece for you because it involves being on the internet a bit, then no, you can't expect uh, the publication to cover your costs. But if what you're pitched is a piece which involves you going to do some reporting in Brazil, um, then I would expect the cost to be covered in that. Um, yeah, so thank you, Toby. So far, I think have, we have covered most of the questions. Uh, does anybody have any additional questions? Please uh, put them in the chat box right now. Uh, this is a very <laughs> interesting and uh, very relevant topic to every one of us. So this is your chance to ask Toby uh, yeah, if you have anything left on your mind. I feel like I should say to everyone, um, it's a really hard time for freelancers at the moment. It's a really hard time for journalism. Money is limited. Budgets for commissioning freelancers across the board are limited. So I know it's hard and it's going to be really difficult to um, to get commissioned at the moment. It's going to, and it's probably going to get harder over the next six months or so, I imagine. But just keep at it. I think persistence is really important. And I think if you're a full-time freelance journalist, it's especially if you're just starting out, it's a good idea to have something else to do alongside it and preferably something flexible. Um, but lots of freelance journalists who now have very successful careers did it alongside something else when they started out. And there's no shame in that and there shouldn't be any shame in that. And I think um, editors are understanding that you might have another job alongside it as well. Yeah, thank you, Toby. Uh, we have a lot of great responses in the chat, how useful this has been. Corinne has asked, uh, yeah, a very interesting question. What is it about a pitch that when you open it makes you absolutely punch there and shout yes? Um, my favourite thing when I get a pitch is when it manages to encapsulate an idea which I didn't even know I'd had. You know, like, there's something kind of percolating in the back of your mind and then the pitch that you get kind of manages to encapsulate that thought that was just vaguely there in your brain in 50 words that's brilliant and it that's always a joy for an editor but equally <clears throat> it's sometimes great when you get a pitch from someone who's heavily involved in something and you're like oh that's the perfect person to write about this thing and i i didn't know how to get in touch with them and now they've got in touch with me so it can be lots of different things but getting good ideas is always great it's having having an idea that you hadn't thought of yourself is is always really nice it makes your my, makes my life easier makes my job easier I guess we're all hoping to write that pitch one day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe one last 
questions so we still have time is do you have a fixed rate or it varies according to oh sorry you've gone i think you sorry can you hear me now yeah i can hear you now so do you have a fixed rate or it varies according to the topic length author different aspects um so the rate varies between desks um it will vary between lengths um, so there is no fixed rate across the Guardian. Um, for example, a TV blog, our rate is £90, but on um, opinion, when I was on opinion, it was £100 for a, an opinion piece. Um, so there is no fixed rate. Um, and most rates are up for negotiation with an editor too. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I can't give you that. Yeah, we also had a negotiations training, uh, so that will be available also on uh, our website and our YouTube that you can later look back to on how to deal with that question. <laughs> yeah, and I think be confident in negotiating. Um, don't necessarily expect them to just give you the, like a huge amount of money that you want to. As I say, money is tight for everyone at the moment, and I'd love to give all my freelance writers more than I'm able to give them. Um, I'm just not able to. Um, but do feel comfortable negotiating um, and trying to get what you think you're worth.